Each of us has just one life to live. Our life should count. It should matter. It should have purpose. And frankly, it should be amazing. But as long as you keep holding on to your own ambitions and you want to do it your way and you want to do your thing and you're not willing to trust him, you will get what you can get, but will never be as much as God wants you to have. The Bible says, commit your way unto the Lord. Listen to this. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Today on Turning Point, you'll learn how to claim the vibrant and victorious life God has for you as Dr. Jeremiah challenges you to make nine crucial decisions straight from God's Word. And you'll discover how to live a God-inspired life coming up on Turning Point. In these messages these last several weeks, I've encouraged you to make nine decisions that will transform your life. But behind each of these decisions is one decision that impacts all of the others. And that decision is, what will you decide to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible says that Jesus came into this world to deliver us from a life of sin and selfishness and separation from God. In a very familiar verse to most of us, the scripture says, all of us have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. But through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that barrier between our holy God and sinful man has been removed. And when we decide to put our trust in Jesus Christ for eternal life, and we invite him into our hearts and our lives, he gives us a life beyond amazing, the life you've been listening to in these weeks. The Lord Jesus wants us to have that life, but it cannot begin until we make that defining decision to put our trust in Jesus Christ. So if you've been listening to these messages and you've been intrigued by the kind of motivational content of some of it, that's all well and good, but you can't even start any of these things until Jesus Christ is at home in your life. If you've never accepted him, if you've never invited him into your life, let me give you that invitation today. Make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Ask him to forgive your sin, and he's never refused to do that for anyone who comes honestly to ask. In these messages that we have been sharing, I have focused on what a life might look like if Jesus is involved and how we might activate that life in our everyday lives. Now, there's one more decision to make. Jesus Christ is in your heart. The Holy Spirit has come to live within your life if you're a Christian. But now, here is the question you must answer. Will I be willing to turn my life over to the Holy Spirit, the person God has given to each of us to orchestrate this life beyond amazing? Am I willing to let him take control? Let me suggest to you that living a life empowered by the Holy Spirit is the only way you can ever be successful as a Christian. If you've tried to sustain any of these nine characteristic traits that I have taught you over these last weeks, if you've tried to do that in your own strength, you've discovered that it's simply too difficult for you. And you know what? You're absolutely right. The Christian life is not hard. It's not difficult. It's impossible unless the Holy Spirit is in control. In the entire history of humanity, only one person has lived a perfect life. That person is Jesus Christ. But you may be amazed to discover that even Jesus Christ did not live that life by his own power. Though he was one with God in power in heaven to be a complete and perfect human, the scripture says that for the years he was on this earth, he voluntarily laid aside the independent use of his divine attributes so that he could identify with us in every way. So guess what? While he was on this earth, he lived by the power of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. One day Jesus told his disciples, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the work. Jesus lived and thought and worked and taught and conquered sin and won victories for God in the power of that same spirit 
who lives within all of us, the spirit whom all of us may have if we will accept his control of our lives. Well, you say, Pastor Jeremiah, how do I do that? I'm a Christian. I know that I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. I know my sins are forgiven. But I have these things in my life that I've tried to get my arms around, and I never seem to get victory over them. It's really frustrating. If there's something I'm missing out on, please tell me. Well, I just want to tell you, you're not missing the Holy Spirit. He lives within you. But you may not be appropriating him properly or allowing him to have control in your life. And if that's true, you will never be able to live the life beyond amazing with any consistency at all. There are certain things that you are going to have to recognize and realize if you want that edge in your Christian experience. Living a life engaged with the Holy Spirit. I hope that as you've listened to these messages and heard me talk about all the possibilities to be a, a person of love and joy and peace and a person that has integrity and a person that has self-discipline, I hope if you listen to all these things that you found within your own heart, a hungering and thirsting after this and saying, I, I want that to be true of my life. Well, I want to tell you again that that's one of the most critical things that you can have, and that's a desire. The Holy Spirit takes up residency in our hearts the moment we believe, but we do not at that moment instantaneously become a fully mature Christian. It takes time for the fruit that the Spirit brings to ripen and become visible in our lives, and we have to do our part. And here's the first thing we have to do. We have to desire the Holy Spirit to be in control. You say, well, that seems kind of, I mean, why are you telling, it doesn't make any, why would you say that? Wouldn't anybody desire the Holy Spirit? No, we don't. Let me tell you where um, many Christians, and I think if I, could, if I could quote people that I've read and if I could look down into the hearts of people that I've met, way too many Christians get saved and the only thing they care about is that they're not going to hell and they're going to heaven and now they're going to do their own thing all the way through life. If you said to them, do you want more of God? Do you want more of the Spirit's control in your life? Many people would say, so what does that mean? And then when you start talking about what God may do in their lives, they back away and say, you know, I'm cool, I'm great. And many of them will say, don't bother me with all that stuff. I know I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven, and I'm confident of that, and I'm comfortable with that, and that's all I want. I'm not into all of this. And they think really walking in the Spirit is some kind of uh, over-the-line out of control walk. The Bible says if you want the Spirit of God to control your life, if you want his power source turned on, you have to desire it. At the climax of one of Israel's festivals, Jesus stood up in the temple and he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And if you read the next verse, you find out he was talking about the Holy Spirit. In another passage, Jesus said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Both of these passages indicate the same thing. We have to desire the Holy Spirit to control us. We have to thirst for his direction in our lives. The direction to the destination and the power to get there belong to the Spirit, but the decision to continually drive forward to the correct destination remains with you. How many of you know when you get in your car, they haven't done this yet at least, they're working on it, you don't turn on the ignition, punch the GPS system, and then sit back and fold your arms, and the car takes you where the GPS system says it's gonna take you. That don't work. By the way, I have a running dispute with the lady in my GPS system. She, she, she's not always telling me the truth. Sometimes she says, turn right, and I know better. I'm supposed to go forward. And you know what happens when you don't follow the lady in the little box in your car? You just wait a few moments, and you hear these words, recalculating, recalculating. And I thought to myself this week, I wonder how many times the Spirit of God has directed me and I've gone on my own way and the Spirit of God has said, recalculating. <laughs> One of the things I know is that God never gives up on us. We take a wrong turn. He doesn't say, okay, that's it for Jeremiah. He went right and I told him to go straight. I'm done with him. No, he keeps after us. He keeps recalculating and bringing our lives back. But here's the issue. 
The Holy Spirit doesn't do the work. He shows you what to do, gives you the strength to do it, but you have to make the decision to follow it. And if you don't, then your GPS system's worthless, and you will be lost, and you won't find your way. So you have to ask yourself the question today, do you want these qualities developed in your life? Do you want to be in a cooperative program with Lord God to work out your own salvation, to work out what God has worked in? Then the Holy Spirit's going to be involved, and you have to give him control. Second, you have to denounce your sin. I love to tell people when I talk about the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit has two names, and his first name is Holy. Because he is holy, the Holy Spirit cannot thrive in a contaminated environment. Ephesians 4.30 says this, Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. I think the New King James says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. One of the classes that impacted me the most during my time at Dallas Seminary was a course taught by Charles Ryrie on the Holy Spirit. In the years since, I have returned to Dr. Ryrie's little book on the Holy Spirit time and time again. In fact, one of the guys who helps me uh, in the research part of what I do in the library over there at, uh, where I keep my books asked me what happened to this book because the cover's gone. There's no back cover. There's no front cover. I said, I just wore it out because every time I turned around, I was picking that book up. If you know Charles Ryrie and his writing, you know he always was a man of few words. He said a lot more in a few words than most people say in volumes. In that book, he wrote, the victorious life or the life which does not grieve the Holy Spirit is the undefeated life. It is the life which is constantly responding to the light as it is revealed in God's Word. As response is made, this will bring to light more areas of darkness which then need to be confessed. And then more light comes, which in turn requires more confession of newly discovered darkness. And so it goes throughout life, but this is the normal way life grows that does not grieve the Spirit. Did you understand what he was saying? He didn't say, if you're living a life that's not grieving the Holy Spirit, you don't ever make any mistakes or you don't ever sin. No, what the Bible teaches is that if you're living a life that does not grieve the Holy Spirit, you're acknowledging sin when it becomes known to you and you deal with it. And here's what you learn as you get older in the Christ and as you grow in Christ, you will become sensitive to things later on that you never even thought of before. And as you become sensitive to the things that you know are not pleasing to God, you don't just blow them off or you don't just excuse yourself for them, you deal with them. And you ask God to forgive you, and you repent. And repentance means to turn from it. It means to take a 180. You're going this way in this particular uh, practice, and God brings conviction to your heart about it, and you say, Lord God, I know this is wrong, and I repent of this, and I'm sorry for this, but that's not the end of it. When you do that, you turn, and you go the other direction. Repentance is not a matter of sorrow and tears and crying. Repentance means to stop doing what you're doing and stop doing the right thing, to repent. And what is so wonderful about Charles Ryrie's statement is that we think what I'm talking about is some kind of subnormal or abnormal. No, this is the way the Christian life is. Someone once told me the Christian life is getting up and falling down, falling down and getting up, falling down and getting up all the way to heaven. Nobody lives a perfect life. Nobody gets there without challenges. But the issue isn't, are you going to be challenged in your life? The issue is, what will you do when it happens? How will you respond to it? How honest are you willing to be before God when he puts his finger on something, and he surely will if you want to walk with him, and he'll say, that spirit you have toward that person is wrong. Lord God, I'm sorry. That's not enough. Go fix it. Walking in the Spirit, not grieving the Spirit, is living a life where you listen to the Spirit of God when he puts his finger on something in your life. And 1 John 1, 9 is the great encouragement that if we confess our sin, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you know that verse wasn't written to unbelievers? That verse was written to young believers, and the apostle John said, listen, when you're walking along the way as a Christian and you mess up or you step in a hole or you do something you shouldn't do or you say something you shouldn't say, listen to me, here's what you need to know. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And get back on the road and keep walking and don't stop. The Christian life is not an uninterrupted road from where you become a Christian all the way to heaven. You're gonna have some stops and some starts. Here's the third thing. Devote yourself to the Word of God. Well, what does that have to do with anything? The process of growing in Christ is impossible without this book. Did you know that nobody has ever been saved except for two things? You have to have the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Nobody will get to heaven unless the Spirit of God and the Word of God has worked in their life. That's how you become a Christian. But did you know also that once you become a Christian, nobody ever grows in their faith without the Spirit of God and the Word of God? Let me tell you how this works. If you want the fruit of love to develop in your life, read the passages in the Bible about love. 1 Corinthians 13, others. If you want to learn how to endure and have greater endurance, study the lives of men like Job or Moses. Do you want to grow in integrity? I suggest you get acquainted with Noah and Abraham and Joseph and Hannah and Daniel and a whole bunch of others. Every day, you and I face situations that require decisions. And if we're going to make the right decisions to be ready for every good work, we have to store up as much of God's Word in our hearts as we can. That way, when those moments come, the Holy Spirit can bring to our mind the passages that we've read and studied and meditated upon, and the principles from those passages will guide us. Let me see if I can make it even clearer. It's like what happens when we use our computers. We store information on the hard drive. Then the operating system uses that information to accomplish the given task. I know that's an oversimplification, but that's basically how it works. Studying and memorizing the Word of God is like loading up your spiritual hard drive with good information, and the Holy Spirit, who is your operating system, uses what you've stored up to operate your life. But if you don't put anything on your hard drive, <laughs> you, you short-circuit the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't work in a vacuum. The Holy Spirit works with the Word of God. Sometimes you say, well, I'm just reading the Scripture and I don't understand it all. I'm not confident that I'm really getting everything out of it. Just read it. Keep reading it. Sooner or later, it'll start to come alive for you. But if you don't read it, if you, if you do not put the Word of God on your hard drive, the Holy Spirit doesn't have anything to work with in your life. Here's one that's tough for all of us men especially. Die to your own ambition not to ambition, to your own ambition. The Bible says in Galatians 5, those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live in the Spirit, we have to walk in the Spirit. We're commanded to walk in the Spirit. It's simply a matter of obedience. We, we must be willing to let God be God, and all God's resources will be available to us if we simply walk in the Spirit. And Paul uses this word walk. It's very interesting. How many of you know walk is one step at a time? Powerful, taking one step at a time. That's how you live the Christian life, one step at a time, putting one spiritual foot in front of the other. Sometimes you walk into the wind. Sometimes you walk with the wind at your back. No matter, regardless of what you're doing in your life, the person who is walking in the Spirit is making progress. When we let go of our ambition, we say to the Holy Spirit, okay, I'm going to get off the throne of my life, and I'm going to put you there. And from now on, what you want will be what I do. I remember a leader who was going through some real struggles in his church, and he said he finally came to grips with this is how he was going to handle it. Every day when he went to work, he'd open his office and look there at the chair in his office and envision that the Spirit of God was there, and he would say to the Spirit of God, I don't know what to do with this mess. It's in your hands. And he would go someplace else and study. Those of us who've grown up in the American ethic know that we're pushed and 
driven to be self-made people. We're motivated to do better, learn, be effective. All of that is well and good. But you have to stop somewhere along the way and ask yourself, who is this for and what is this about? And you have to ask God to give you clarity on that. No servant can serve two masters. You cannot have two CEOs in your life. You can only get to have one. And you have to make the decision. The Lord God isn't going to make it for you. You have to decide, okay, I've been tooling along here in my boat with a whole lot less power than I think I should have. Maybe there's something else. And then just stop dead in your tracks and say, I'm going to let God take control. I'm going to let God run my life. I'm going to read his word. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit direct me. Listen to me. God's plan for your life is better than any you can imagine. But as long as you keep holding on to your own ambitions and you want to do it your way and you want to do your thing and you're not willing to trust him, you will get what you can get, but will never be as much as God wants you to have. The Bible says, commit your way unto the Lord. Listen to this. And he will give you the desires of your heart. So ask yourself, what is it you desire? And then commit yourself to the Lord. The Spirit of God is just waiting for you to say yes. Yes, take control. I'll follow your direction. And then you've got to commit yourself to do what he tells you to do. So the question is this, what do you want your life to be like? The Apostle Paul puts it very plainly. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. What will your life be like when you're led by the Spirit of God? Will all the potholes be filled, all the detours straightened, all the doors opened? Absolutely not. Being filled by the Spirit doesn't mean your world suddenly becomes the Garden of Eden. You still deal with crabgrass and storms and clouds in your life, but you'll see a huge difference in how you deal with them because it's not now just you, it's the Holy Spirit in you doing his work through your life. When the Holy Spirit is at home in your life, the nine virtues that we have been talking about will not only be the gifts of God that you have received at your salvation, they will be virtues that are growing and you will be able to discern growth in your life because the Holy Spirit is at work. Along the way, there'll be a lot of blessings. Along the way, there'll be some tests, but along the way, you will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit every day. And the fruit of the Spirit is about transformation, making you different. So here we are at the end of this series, and here we are at the end of this message, and where do we go from here? I just want to leave you with this thought, wherever you are on this journey. Many of you are Christians, have been for a long time, still looking for that power in your life to be used of God. Some of you are brand new in the faith. Maybe you've just been baptized, and you're getting your, you're, you're getting your start in, as walking with the Lord. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, just keep going. Don't quit. Keep utilizing what God gives you. Keep taking what you learn and putting it into practice. Don't just be a collector of information. I'm glad when I see you take notes, but I hope you're taking notes so you can remember what the Word of God says, so you can remember when you read it again what to do. The Bible says we're not to be hearers of the Word only, but doers. One of my greatest fears is that I'm a teacher of the Word of God, and people come, and they're more smart about the Bible than they ever were, but they don't allow the Word of God to matriculate down into the everyday life that they live. So here's what I'm saying. Just keep going. Don't quit. There's a story about a mother who had a young son who was struggling to learn to play the piano, and she thought it might encourage him to attend a concert of a great pianist who was visiting their city. As they were seated, the mother spotted a friend and left her seat to go speak to her. Her son, a very curious young man, took the opportunity to explore the grand music hall where this event was taking place. Soon he wandered through a door marked, no admittance. When the house lights dimmed and the mother returned to her seat and realized that her child was missing, before she could do anything about it, 
The curtains opened on the spotlighted center stage, and the audience gasped with a mixture of laughter and anger. When the mother saw the cause of her reaction, she gasped in horror. There at the keyboard of this grand piano sat her little boy, innocently picking out twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> at that moment, the master pianist made his entrance. He quickly moved to the piano and whispered in the little boy's ear, don't quit, keep playing. And then the great piano master leaned over the boy with his left hand and began filling in the bass accompaniment to Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And a moment later, his right arm reached around to the other side and added a running obligato. And when the last note sounded, the mesmerized audience stood to their feet and thundered their applause. Together, the old master and the young novice had transformed an awkward situation into a wonderfully creative moment. And this is what God does with us. No matter how hard we try to live godly lives, our efforts always seem to come up short. But when God enters, he turns our halting music into a masterpiece. He takes our efforts done in good faith, and he honors our efforts. But not only that, by his Holy Spirit, he transformed those efforts into something beyond what we could ever do if we had the best day of our life. And that is what Paul was telling us when he wrote, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Sit down at the piano and begin to play. But don't worry, it is God who works in you, both to will with his right hand and to do with his left hand what is necessary. So the indispensable key is what the master said to the little boy. Don't quit. Keep playing. Thank you for joining me today on Turning Point. Let me say again, God intends for your Christian life to be amazing. God wants you to overcome the roadblocks in your life, discover the roadmap, and reap the results of the life Christ died to provide for you. Such a life begins with faith in Christ as Lord and Savior and continues with knowing and trusting in His Word. So if you've never put your faith in Christ and been born again through Him, today is the day that you can do that. The first step is to repent of your sin and to ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior. Once you make that decision to accept God's free gift of salvation, your journey with God as a new creation in Christ will begin. If you've taken this step of faith today, please share your decision with other Christians at a trustworthy ministry or a local church so that you can grow in your newfound faith. May God bless you as you begin your walk with God, and I look forward to seeing you next time right here on Turning Point.